I have the opportunity to ride a lot of e-bikes, which is awesome because electric bikes are fun, but the batteries in e-bikes contain cobalt. This is a problem because of the way that cobalt is extracted from the ground. More specifically, who's doing it? A significant amount of cobalt mining is done by children. And it's not just lithium batteries for e-bikes. It's cell phones, it's laptops, it's electric vehicles. Anything with a lithium battery, which is pretty much all electronics, likely contain cobalt. Which means even the device that you're watching this on is probably associated or linked to child labor. Not all lithium batteries are the same. Manufacturers use different types and quantities of raw materials to favor different kinds of performances. Some compositions are low cost, others provide longevity, and still others are allow you to do more charge cycles. One of the most popular compositions is NMC, or lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. It's a mouthful, but it's widely used, and it's one of the major batteries that contains cobalt. And while the Reddit debate will rage on of the advantages and disadvantages of all battery types, NMC batteries have a key selling point of energy density. And this means you get more range. Putting it as straightforward as possible, if you use cobalt, you get more range. And as long as range anxiety is a very real concern, manufacturers are going to continue to prior prioritize extending the range of that vehicle. One immediate solution to the cobalt child labor problem is to just not use cobalt. There has been a push for cobalt free batteries and in some cases, more specifically Congolese cobalt free batteries. In the Congo is where the majority of the human rights violations are happening. This is one of the thousands of unregulated, unmonitored mines in the DRC. It's crawling with children working like modern day slaves. Where as many as 40,000 kids are mining there. Some manufacturers are already taking the lead on this, most notably Tesla, the Model 3 and the Model Y. Now the standard range, the most limited range options, are already being produced with a cobalt-free battery, and Rivian and others are already starting to follow suit. The limitations with this approach is that the demand for electric vehicles, e-bikes, electronics continues to grow and soar. Um, and it's unlikely that a cobalt-free battery will be able to meet that demand. By 2035, at least on the books, California has a, has a law that all new cars sold will be electric. If you look at, Amer at polls in America, four in 10 adults say that their next car will be electric. And then when you look at the cobalt industry itself, uh, a large mine in the Congo just recently invested another $800 million into their cobalt and refinery productions so that they would be able to, to expand. And so despite the fact that if you're watching this in Q4 of 2023 or some other period where there's a slump or a slower growth, all the long-term market indicators seem to be pointing in the direction that the EV and e-bike market is going to grow tremendously and cobalt is going to be a part of that future. So let's take a look at the Congo so that we can understand the cobalt situation in a little bit more depth. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, often referred to as the DRC or simply the Congo, is a large resource rich country in Africa. It is the 11th largest country in the world, roughly the size of the Western United States with a population uh, of around 100 million. 70% of the world's cobalt comes from a small southeastern region, two provinces, the Lualaba and the Huat Katanga. This is not the only resources in the Congo by any means. Estimates of the total natural mineral wealth are around $24 trillion. You heard that right, $24 trillion. It is very likely that the Congo is the wealthiest country in the world in terms of natural resources. It's The scale is simply mind blowing. Um, if you look at, and it's not just mineral resources, if you look at the Congo River, it's the second largest river in the world and an excellent candidate for hydroelectric power. It's 3,000 miles long, but if you take a short 100 meter section, there's a proposed project, a hydroelectric power station that if fully built out, 
could power a quarter of the continent of Africa. And in a cruel twist of irony, to contrast all of this natural wealth, the people of the Congo are among the poorest in the world. GDP per capita is a way to measure the economic value output of every individual in, the, in a country. For reference, the GDP per capita of the United States is roughly $75,000. The Congos, it is $577, second worst in the world, only beating out Haiti. There are so many data points that show the struggle just to survive in the Congo. Two thirds of the population, that's around 60 million people are living off of $2 a day. In terms of the Human Development Index, HDI, it's in the bottom 12th, right around Afghanistan. If you look at healthcare, 11% uh, of global malaria deaths come from the Congo. It, this is a treatable disease. Education, I quote the World Bank, the quality of education is extremely poor, with an estimated 97% of 10 year olds in the DRC being in learning poverty, meaning that they cannot read or understand simple text. Across the board, there's problems with low income, education, healthcare, to say nothing of ongoing civil and political unrest. How is it possible that a country so rich in natural resources can have such a low standard of living for the people of, the, of that country? Unfortunately, this is a, an observed phenomenon and it even has a name. It's called the resource curse. And it's been observed in many countries, Sierra Leone, Bolivia, Venezuela, and even some of the states within the United States, such as like West Virginia and the coal mining industry are all observed to be uh, candidates for, for the resource curse. No one knows exactly why this is true, but there are a lot of opinions and hypotheses. One observation is that these countries tend to be more autocratic. This creates a problem because the, the revenue, the state budget, is often, often comes from taxing the extracted minerals rather than taxing the people. This incentivizes corruption and actors that enrich themselves at the expense of the people. And this creates a system that enriches the Congolese elite, foreign investors, and it benefits the outside world that gets access, that gets cheap access to valuable minerals at the expense of the Congolese people. There are numerous steps and multiple players involved in the process from turning cobalt ore into lithium batteries. Cobalt is extracted from the ground in one of two ways. LSM or large scale mining operations is the primary method. Think of an industrial firm. These are, these employ a professional workforce. They have safety procedures. There is environmental and government oversight. Yes, it is in a corrupt world, so the extent of that happening is, is questionable, but it does exist in some format. This is the kind of place that has international investment. The alternative to that is ASM, artisanal or small scale mining. Artisanal in this case is a deceptive word. When I hear that, I think of overpriced coffee. This is not that. ASM mining is workers, subsistence workers, that are trying to scratch a living out of the ground. They are trying to make one or two dollars a day. When you see the videos, it looks like something that is out of the wrong century. The conditions are brutal and grueling in an environment where they're inhaling toxic cobalt dust. It's, it's absolutely backbreaking work, and what is most noticeable is the despair and hopelessness that's coming from these workers. There's little to no opportunity to find a way out. In this worst environment possible is where you will find child labor. We are talking kids as young as six. ASM cobalt production in the Congo is significant. The DRC produces or mines the overwhelming majority of the cobalt in the world. There's no other country that is close. But when you break off the ASM chunk from the total amount that the Congo mines, ASM mining in the Congo is the second largest producer of cobalt in the world. They're double the next largest country's output. Once the cobalt is mined, there is an intermediary step 
in ASM before it's transported into the professional supply chain. 50 kilogram cobalt sacks will get transported to depots that buy up and aggregate large amounts of cobalt and then sell them to the refineries or the large scale mines. This unfortunately also serves to obscure where the cobalt is coming from and who's mining it. It's incredibly hard to trace or impossible to trace once the bags get aggregated. Here's where we stand. We've got a cobalt supply chain and within the ASM sector, a child labor crisis. This does not mean that the industrial sector isn't involved. In fact, quite the opposite. Artisanal dig sites are often within industrial lands and refineries are clearly purchasing cobalt from the depots which buy um, artisanal and child labor called cobalt. The question becomes, how do we stop children from mining cobalt? I find wisdom in Siddharth Kara's words. He's the author of the influential book Cobalt Red, which details in depth the horrors of cobalt mining in the Congo. The, the power is in our hands now. The world has learned of a horror. And in, throughout the history of human rights, change happens through a system. First, truth comes out. People learn of a horror. And then people of conscience band together and say, this injustice cannot stand, and we're not going to stop clamoring and agitating until change happens. I want to remain realistic yet hopeful. Change happens through elevated awareness that creates movements. These movements can put pressure on tech companies to understand their supply chain better, pressure on the U.S. government to negotiate with China and the Congo to create, maintain, and enforce labor standards. Pressure that empowers artisanal miners to come forward and tell their stories on an international stage. Pressure that empowers NGOs. There's not a single action to solve this problem, but rather a single belief that children shouldn't be mining cobalt, and then solutions are going to come forward from many different angles. The, this is an issue that is complex and intertwined in geopolitics. But we've already taken the first steps, which is to be aware that this is happening. And as Siddharth has said in many podcasts and news outlets, the next step is to amplify that awareness. Thank you for watching.